Hi, uh, AJ Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, fan of lots of stuff. I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about the Shakespeare professor angle thing for a, for a change, not in terms of, um, you know, analyzing text, but simply because I'm in the UK for the first time in three years uh, to attend the International Shakespeare Conference in Stratford. And um, while I can't, you know, take you into the conference itself and, you know, have you listen to papers, which I, I don't think many of you would find particularly gripping because it's an entirely professional conference aimed at other professional Shakespeareans. I can walk you around Stratford a little bit and uh, show you why I really like coming to this part of the world. And, um, and I can also offer a summary review of the current RSC production of Richard III, for those of you who might care. Um, and that's all I'm going to do today, so I hope you like it. So this is Stratford-upon-Avon. This specifically is the High Street. It's a medieval market town in fairly rural Warwickshire and of course is now famous and, uh, and a, a particular tourist draw as being um, the birthplace of the world's most famous writer, William Shakespeare, who made his career in London but was born and died here in Stratford. It's also home to the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, since, what, 1960 or thereabouts. And in the Shakespeare Centre next door to the birthplace at the top of Henley Street is the RSC's archive, the videos and such of past productions, which I've used a number of times in research. Quote from Festa the Jester from Twelfth Night Foolery, sir, does walk about the orb like the sun. It shines everywhere. Case in point, uh, we took a moment off from the conference to cheer on the baton for the Commonwealth Games, which happened to be passing through Stratford today. Commonwealth Games begin next week in nearby Birmingham, run through the first week of August. They're sort of like a mini Olympic Games for countries with a historical slash colonial connection to the UK. The baton, which you can see there, is kind of like the Olympic torch. It's all very festive. Stratford's dotted with 15th, 16th century buildings, some of which you can stay in. Here's my room at the Mercure, my favorite hotel in Stratford, and Second time I've been in a four-poster bed in the last month. One of the great things about this hotel is that it is sort of part 16th century. It's not all, but bits of it are. And uh, some of the, the more interesting rooms and such have this. this is, it's called the Shakespeare, but it's run by Mercure. And this is where I always stay when I'm in Stratford. A little bit down the high street from the hotel is the Guild Chapel, which was built in the late 13th century and uh, decorated inside in around 1500 with these beautiful um, medieval paintings. And um, it was Shakespeare's father who about 70 years later was responsible for painting over them as uh, instructed by the town council uh, to cover up what was considered Catholic iconography. Obviously, this was after the Reformation. Next door to the Guild Chapel is King Edward's School, which uh, was almost certainly attended by Shakespeare, the only education he had before heading to London to become a playwright and actor. And down the street on the right is the Shakespeare Institute, which is where my conference is. But we're not going to go then. This is Holy Trinity Church, where on the uh, 26th of April, 1564, Shakespeare was 
baptized, having been born probably three days earlier, and where on where after he died on the 23rd of April 1616, he was buried at the ripe old age of 52. I like graveyards. The church sits right by the river Avon. And one of the nice things to do in Stratford is to walk up and down the river. Or you can walk on both sides. Um, around the town area and then on the other side to get away from the town and into the country. Country which probably hasn't changed that much since Shakespeare lived here. All these boats named after various Shakespearean characters, Juliet, Virgilio, Ursula, Cressida, Volumnia, and Ophelia. Raising the question as to whether the person who named this boat has ever read the play. This way to muddy death. A little upstream and on the other side of the river, we can see the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, Theatre Complex, newly refurbished. And here's Holy Trinity from the other side of the river. It's pretty, isn't it? Beautiful. And to a certain extent, largely unchanged, I think, over the last 400 years or so. The river was central to the prosperity of Stratford in terms of being able to move goods in and out of the town. And uh, obviously later on, uh, the river was sort of made navigable, created, creating canals with a, a system of, of locks, which are still here. But it's amazing when you walk around here, how easy it is to leave the town behind and get away from all the tourists who never venture beyond the, the, the town center itself. Wood pigeon. This is what I really like to do when I'm here. Just walk, get away from everything, get everybody, walk down by the river. See the Avon? If you can look, and over there you see the spire. That's Holy Trinity, where Shakespeare is buried. Beautiful. Looping back around and coming into town from the other side, we get to uh, Hallscroft, which is where um, uh, Shakespeare's son-in-law, a doctor, lived, married to uh, Susanna Shakespeare. A couple of other RSC properties here. The, the other place was a small in the round theatre often used for promenade type productions where the audience is sort of standing and really, really close to the actors. There's a, a particularly uh, great production of Julius Caesar here. And um, then there's the Courtyard Theatre also, which was a sort of makeshift space while the RST was being remodeled and which housed the uh, Trevor Nunn directed production of King Lear with Ian McKellen, which I happen to see. And then I met him in the pub. That was cool. <laughs> Stratford's most famous pub, the Black Swan, an easy staggering distance from the theater home to many a Shakespearean actor who was supposed to be on stage, especially you know, Richard Burton, Richard Harris, uh, Peter O'Toole. They say it's called the, 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 the Black Swan, but it's known sort of more 
by its unofficial name. You see the other side of the sign there, the Dirty Duck. This is where I'll be tonight after the show. This is the, the Royal Shakespeare Theatre Complex. Um, there's actually two theatres, the main theatre, the, which is the RST, and then this round building, which is smaller, that's the Swan. Swan may be one of my favourite theatres in the world. I won't be able to shoot any pictures in there, unfortunately, tonight. The tower is just an observation thing, strictly a touristy thing, a money maker for the company. And how was the show, I hear you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, I, thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. Um, <clears throat> you know, some, some productions of Richard III are standalones, right? And some are part of a version of the larger first tetralogy sequence. This was the latter. So I think, you know, it, it was, so some of the design elements and everything were about fitting into the, the productions of Henry VI, part one, two, and three, which had gone before. And I think that it did well. Um, I thought that it made good use of that deep thrust stage at the, um, at the RST. Uh, there's a, a large sort of quasi First World War uh, cenotaph in the, in the background, which I thought was sort of underused there is a sort of iconic presence and at the very end they did a little projection onto it but otherwise it seemed somewhat um redundant um the cast i thought was strong um a little uneven in parts um but a, a lot of the, the the strongest supporting roles buckingham i thought was really good all the women were great um, I particularly liked uh, Lady Elizabeth, uh, Princess Elizabeth, and um, um, and Mariah Gale, who was, although I guess she goes by Minnie Gale now, who was playing Margaret, which is sort of startling to see because she's, you know, it's not long since she was playing Ophelia to David Tennant's Hamlet. So to see her playing, you know, the sort of old, uh, vengeful, hag-like queen um, was somewhat surprising, but she has her usual compelling uh, theatrical power. The lead himself, I thought, was com was was solid. Uh, I mean, it, it got, the show got a lot of attention because he was a disabled actor. One hand is obviously um, very uh, dis disabled. Um, I'm not entirely sure that the production ever really decided what to make of that. Um, and the one moment in which he draws attention to his arm and talks about how it's sort of withered and he's been cursed and so on, he was indicating the other arm. And I, to be honest, I, I, I couldn't decide if, if they were doing something very clever and I just didn't understand it, or if, or if there was something uncomfortable about directing attention to the actual deformity. I, I don't know, but it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Um, <coughs> He's a, he's a perfectly capable actor. Um, I didn't get a lot of levels to him, you know. The, those, um, he's very capable of, 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 you know, Richard always sort of draws the audience in, makes them sort of fall in love with them even while they hate him. Um, and I thought he did that side of things pretty well. But I was never entirely clear on why he was doing anything or what the sort of levels of awareness were. When he woke up from the, the dream sequence right before the battle at the end, there's that extraordinary long speech in which his character sort of breaks down. <clears throat> he turns on himself, you know. Uh, uh, I, I'm a murderer. No, I'm not. I, I love myself. I hate myself. And this sort of strange back and forth. I, and I don't think anybody 
before Shakespeare had ever written character quite like that. In that moment, I use it actually a little in my uh, in Burning Shakespeare as this sort of huge leap forward for Shakespeare as a writer in terms of the creation of really, really complex characters who seem to escape their scripted function somehow, you know. But in this production, it went by fairly quickly, and, and I never really got that sense of an absolutely tortured presence um, somehow stepping outside the, the, the role that he was being forced to play as, a, as an actor. <coughs> um, the best part of the show, I thought, was the battle scene itself, right, which they did mostly with ghosts, the ghosts that come to haunt um, uh, I should say spoiler if you haven't seen this and are going to then don't watch this bit but um, the, the ghosts that haunt Richard at, at the end then and come in in this sort of white very ethereal sort of moving in very abstract choreographed half speed kind of motions and then they come together to form his horse it's the kind of theater I love right where where um, something which is abstract then sort of coalesces into something real and he goes and he's up on the horse and we hear the horse and it's charging into battle carried by the ghosts of the people he's killed you know which is a wonderful idea and a wonderful image and they're all in white um and and we hear the horse and then we we the horse goes down and then the, the horse becomes the horse of uh, of richmond of, of um, future henry the seventh so that you know, famous line about a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, which is often actually sort of a throwaway in performance. It doesn't carry a lot of weight. Has this sort of sense of this is one of those those lines, one the few lines in the play. Apart from now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the son of York, and so on. Um, one of the few lines in the play that a lot of people actually know. So there's this odd sense that this is the moment that Richard was always moving toward. And I've never seen it done, so this sort of fairly disposable, unimportant, borderline comic line, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, is given this sort of strange resonance and power because of the way, of the staging. I, I, I really liked that. Um, a few things I, I wasn't crazy about. It, it, the production is sort of period eclectic, so people are carrying swords and halberds, but they're also wearing sort of mostly modern military headdresses. Um, the women are all wearing um, vaguely medieval or Renaissance um, dresses, which look very similar. Um, and the you know, and the, and the king and the, and the courtiers are, are in armor and, and so on. But, you know, there's a moment near the end where suddenly people show up with big video with cameras to shoot and pr the, the projection goes up on the cenotaph behind. And, and it felt jarring. I don't have a problem with mixing periods, but I'd want to see that established earlier in the show so that it doesn't feel bizarre, because you're about to go into a battle. We haven't seen that kind of technology. We haven't seen people using cell phones or looking at their watches or anything like that up to that point. Suddenly there are video cameras on stage, and these guys are carrying swords and halberds, and I'm like, if I'm going into battle and you've got that, then I want my machine gun, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and there's something also, the, the, the projection, they would it was being done almost like a press conference. The, these are the speeches before battle, which is a perfectly valid way to do them. I've seen seen them done in this and other plays like that before, with the projection behind on, on the cenotaph. The problem was that they weren't using a live feed from the camera to project onto the back. So they had pre-recorded the speech that was projected onto the back, and the actor was having to try to simulate the exact same timing to a dead camera. And of course you can't, so it's slightly off, there's a, and there's a sort of, and to me, I, I, those kind of little things I find unnecessarily distracting, you know? It's like, if, it, I just want to, if it's a projection, then make it a projection. Make the camera work. I understand people get worried about the technology, but I, I, that just sort of, was one of those moments that just sort of nudges me out. The highlight of the show for me 
I was sitting, <clears throat> you, you know, how you experience a Shakespeare play, particularly in a theatre like the RST, depends a lot on where you sit. Um, it, as I say, it's a very deep thrust stage. So, you know, one of the ways to see, to best see the sort of patterns of movement around the stage and any scenic elements that are in incorporated is by sitting up high, where you're looking down and you can see that whole big rectangle that sticks right out into the audience. Um, that's generally not how I like to see a show unless I know that the production itself is going to be really well suited to that. So I was sitting right down front in the front row on the corner on one side slightly. Now when you're sitting down there, you know, and the actors are standing on, on a, uh, your, your eyes are sort of at the level of their boots, you know, and, and because it's a thrust stage, the, you're going to get some stuff played directly to you, but some stuff is going to be played to the other side, some is going to be played out to the front. So you're going to miss some, you know, lose some faces, you know, lose some moments of interaction. When it's well directed, as I thought this was by Greg Doran, um, the action is often fairly mobile. I talked about this before, that sort of balancing the plate acting that they, you do at the Globe, that sense of constantly trying to keep moving, if only so that somebody can always see somebody's face. So in, wherever you are in the audience, you can always see something. Um, but obviously, yeah, you lose some stuff, but you do have an ability to make eye contact with the audience, right? When you're on stage and the auditorium is largely in darkness, the only people you can really see from stage are the ones in those first rows. So occasionally an actor will find you, you know, and you'll get a line delivered directly to you. And I always really like that. I feel, it makes me feel part of the show. And there was that moment when um, Richard is trying to get Elizabeth to, um, to give him his daughter, despite all the terrible things he has done to her. Um, and he sort of badges her and badges her and badges her. And in the end, she says, sort of, okay. And then he says, and she leaves. And, um, and he says, I forget the line, about the fickleness of women and how sort of easy this is, you know. And then he leaves. And in the play, it turns out that he's wrong. And he's wrong really for the first time that she plays him, that she pretends to go along with him to protect herself and her daughter, but then she goes straight to Richmond and marries her daughter to the future King Henry VII. Um, and in this production, she didn't go all the way off. She started to go and he kind of just sort of forgot her presence and turned away from her and did his lines about how easy that was. And she was still there watching him. And we sensed as an audience that he got it wrong. You know, uh, that um, that she had outmaneuvered him, and and I guess at some point she must have just decided that to really make that moment land, she would sort of pick somebody she could see and make direct eye contact with them and give them that sort of knowing eye roll, -like, not exactly an eye roll, just a knowing look that says, "Yeah, I know what's going on, and I, I know how I'm going to beat him." And in this case, that happened to be me. Um, and that's just by virtue of the fact that of where I was sitting. And she looked directly at me. And, and it's like you're in the scene. You, and there's this sort of moment of exchange between you and the actor. And she just looks and she says, yeah, see? And I'm like, yeah. And then she leaves. And I've had moments like that before. Actually, you know... Not that long ago, I had a similar kind of moment with the, the late, great Anthony Sher. And as a, as a theatre goer, these are the things that really stay with you because it's that sort of, it reinforces that sense of the liveness of the event that cannot be captured in any other way. That it's something you can only experience by actually being in the theatre itself, in the presence of the actors. And it's absolutely, you know, worth the price of admission for me anyway. So yeah, so um, overall, I enjoyed the show. I thought the first half was too long and too slow, but um, um, and I would I'd like more more concept, more sense of 
of purpose, more sense of an argument about their take on the character and the purpose. You know, one of the things I, I often say when we, when we sit down, when any company sits down to choose its season, the first question is always, why this play? And why, why now? Right? Um, <clears throat> and maybe the answer to those questions is, well, because we just did the first three parts of Henry the Sixth, and now we have to do Richard the Third. And may, and, but that's not quite good enough, is it, as an answer by itself. That there needs to be a sense of there is something we want to say here. We have a particular take on this, on this play that's going to make it electrifying and compelling. And I never quite got that. I, I, I thought it was a perfectly solid, competent telling of the story with some lovely moments here and there. But that sense of urgency, I, that sense of um, a dominant driving idea or even aesthetic, I never really got. Um, so, yeah, I'll give it maybe a six out of ten. That's meaningless. I don't know why I bothered saying that. But yeah, anyway, but it, I, I, and if you happen to be in Stratford or if you I don't know if it's going to transfer to London, um, but I think it's definitely worth seeing. Um, and um, but get try to sit close, and that's it. Um, I am gonna go from Stratford to the north to, to Preston um, and uh, spend a few days up there with family. So I hopefully will find some interesting little bits of things to to turn into a, a video while I'm there. So yeah, so like, comment, subscribe, send ideas or thoughts. Check out my Patreon page and um, hopefully I will have interesting things to show you soon. In the meantime, be well. Cheers.